So good morning. We're here with another episode of Better Business, Better Life. And today I'm really privileged to have Scott Rusnak with us. Um, Scott has actually successfully exited from two of his own businesses. He's also been working as a consultant, providing business advice for a number of years now. And he's the author of the Entrepreneur's Field Guide, which actually says that it's, it's up to you to design your own life before someone else does it for you. On top of that, Scott is actually a coach for many elite athletes, and he is a certified EOS implementer. So welcome, Scott. Wow, thanks, everyone. You actually made me sound like I'm buttoned up, so I appreciate that. <laughs> I think you are more than buttoned up. <laughs> hey, um, I, I, I always like to sort of get people to have a bit of a, um, a get-to-know session with the person I'm talking to. So let's start, first of all, Scott, with um, giving them a little bit about your personal best and your professional best and what you're really proud of in your life. You know, the personal best is sitting here on my porch in Solano Beach, California. Uh, the listeners can't see it, but I've got my surfboard in the background. I just I wrapped up that. a couple of client calls. Um, and I'm just really living the life I want to live. And I've always said it, success isn't rocket science. It's just get clear on what you want and focus on it. And uh, I'd say that's my, that's my business best. It's just really being able to focus on those things. Personal best, gosh, it'll bring tears to my eyes, but... Uh, my youngest son just got graduated from college. He's got a great oh, finance cool. degree. My oldest son is in the entertainment business. And uh, my amazing wife is still just cranking away in her field of work. So we're all lucky to live the life we want to live. That sounds absolutely awesome. So have you always lived there? Have you always lived at the beach? No. In fact, I grew up on the frozen prairies in Alberta in Canada, which uh, I'm very fond of, but uh, it got a little chilly for me. So it was an easy move down, down to the States when uh, the internet was kicking in. Yeah, brilliant. And look, you, um, you, you've had a couple of really successful businesses. What made you want to go into your own business? Well, right from a, a young age, I was that kid who had multiple paper routes and grew them by having neighborhood kids help me deliver papers. And then as I got into high school, I had a bicycle repair business. I put myself through college with a lot of different odd jobs. And it wasn't until I got my first big break, and I'll put a plug in for my uncle, Robert Butler, gave me a job selling advertising for his firm. And I just realized that I had a real entrepreneurial knack and I could put that to work. And from there, I was lucky enough to get a, you know, a reasonable, decent corporate job for a couple of years, but that burning itch to get back into that entrepreneurial life really kicked in in that early 90s. Yeah. So what what was it? What was it? Yeah, we talk about the entrepreneurs. I, I understand because I, I have a similar kind of background myself. I, I did a, a number of years in corporate, but was just desperate to get out. Yeah. What, yeah, what, what kick-started it? What was, the, what was the itch that you couldn't live with anymore? Well, two things. First of all, uh, the company had started to sell this thing called software, and I was like, wow, look at that. That little chip can make you a fair amount of money, can really make a difference in the world help change a business. At about the same time, I was getting married and my soon-to-be father-in-law was a superintendent of schools. And he said, you know, Scott, Apple's got this product and it's for schools and it's not that good. You should look at maybe trying to make one of those. And it was called Mac School back then. And luckily enough, I had a pretty bright friend that uh, was headed in that direction in the software world. And we pulled together a, a neat little company that became, became School logic, and we just competed against Apple and these big Goliaths in the marketplace. And it was a, it was just a really amazing time in my life. So competing with with giants like that, I mean, that must have been scary, exciting. I mean, what were the what were the different stages that you went through in that business? I'd rather compete against a giant because you know it's a big steamship in front of you. It's got a big wide wake, and we figured out the perfect customer in our industry, just went after those customers and the giants weren't looking at the table scraps. Well, we put enough of those things in place that we were able to build a pretty good sized business that they soon wanted to acquire. Ah, so it was actually ended up being bought by Apple. Is that how it worked? Uh, uh, not Apple, but someone else who I can't disclose. Uh, no, that's okay. Fair enough. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay. And so, you know, um, Looking from the outside in, people will go, wow, that you had a great success there. I'm sure it wasn't all a bed of roses. What were the sort of challenges that you faced in growing that business from being, you know, two guys with an idea through to actually having a business that was saleable? Yeah. yeah. One of the tentpole moments was when I was about to turn 30, my wife was due with our first baby. She was ready to leave her corporate job so we could move to the States and really establish the business. Well, I was so worried about 
payroll growth, employees, what was going to happen next that I actually checked myself in the hospital. I thought I was having a, a heart attack. It turned out I had too much ice cream and beer that day. But it just made me realize that, you know, if you're doing the wrong things, putting the wrong things in your body, into your mind, if you're not curating that environment, not only for yourself, but your employees, your clients, and your loved ones, you're just not going to get to where you want to be. So, um, you know, and, I, and I've sort of shimmied away from your question in the right way, but for me, it's kind of one of those, if you're not constantly growing, you're most likely, likely stagnating. And gosh, if you're stagnating, you're in a state of decline. So I always look at these reset moments for myself so my, and my clients to make sure that you're putting yourself on the path, not only to have the business you want, but the life you want. Yeah, fair enough. And so your book obviously talks about designing your life. A lot of people that I have spoken to, you know, work becomes the all-consuming thing. And I agree with you. I think if you're not actually got a really well-rounded life, then it's probably not worth living, if I'm honest. Um, so how do you, what does your book give in terms of tips around how to design that life and, and get the most from business and from your life? Yeah. Great question. I guess one of the big things is I challenge the readers to be intentional about making every decision from this day forward with their future self in mind. And that doesn't mean some sort of panacea, but it's just seize the moment and make sure you're living and breathing with your own core values and your own vision in mind and make sure others know that you're on that path. Mm hmm. It makes perfect sense. So in the in the business, I mean, apart from the moment where you're checking yourself into hospital, which is pretty major, were there yeah. any other sort of, you know, really big challenges that you faced that almost felt insurmountable? And if so, yeah. how did you yeah. overcome them? Yeah, absolutely. As we were going behind this massive behemoth of Apple and then Pearson Learning, we knew that at certain times we had to retool the business and reinvent ourselves. And we did that a couple of times and it was daunting. It yeah. was frightening, but we knew each and every time that we had to walk before we would run and really designed how we wanted the business to flow, not in, only for ourselves, but our clients. And it was just that open and honest communication part that helped us a ton. Okay. And you, 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 we had a quick chat before we got onto this sort of podcast and you talked obviously about the fact that you use some of the EOS tools and you're now an, a certified EOS implementer. What do you think were the, the, the what, what was the, what part of EOS was, had the most significant impact on your business, do you think? Oh boy, core values. Core values. Really yep. You've got to live and breathe with those core values in mind from the moment you wake up to the sessions you're in to how you close out your day Every tricky decision, if you can use those core values as your bar, your guiding light, I think you're going to get everything you want out of your business and your life. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm on exactly the same page. I suppose it's a little bit of a challenge, though. I mean, you've worked in corporate, I've worked in corporate, and there is a tendency within corporate to take those, you know, the core values and stick them on a poster on the wall and go, hey, we've got some core values. Now let's do that. Um and, and that means that for some business owners going out on their own for the first time, that's all they remember of core values. We know that it's not like that, but I suppose how would you encourage people to really think about those core values and, and yeah, what, what, what's the secret to core values in your opinion? Oh, my gosh. Yesterday I had a session with a really neat client. Their, their client is called 5210, and they run a, a multifamily group out of Phoenix, Arizona, They've got some incredible core values. But one thing they do is they make sure these core values are evangelized, repeated, brought up every day, every week in their level 10s. And a core value I absolutely love that they have is a mindset core value. And it's called it will happen. So everyone has a mindset in that organization that it will happen. And these aren't flimsy, floozy core values that are like Disneyland. These are very realistic based on rocks, measurables, and the vision within the company. So they absolutely live and breathe with those core values in mind. I've got another client um, called Mar Residential. One of their core values is ridiculously responsive. Well, what does that mean for every employee? So they think about that with their vendors, their residents, and one another. They've got to be ridiculously responsive. So if we're living and breathing with those things in mind, I think you're going to get most everything you want out of your life. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. So um, you've been doing EOS implementation now for how long has it been? My gosh, purely about five years. I had a yep. period of my life where I was kind of doing it uh, by the book, but not by the book, but purely for five years. 
Okay. And what what made you decide to become an, an implementer? Yeah. Uh, as I was going through my own journey as a management consultant, uh, let's just say I used the Scott operating system, which if you looked at it, it stands for SOS, which could be save our souls as well. <laughs> So my clients were doing pretty good, but it wasn't yeah. until a lifelong friend who'd been in the community for quite a while said, hey, Scott, uh, we know you've got ADD. We know that you're dyslexic. You've got all these things going on. Here's a structure you can bring to your clients and it can get you everything you want and get them everything you want. So that was an absolute light bulb moment for me. Brilliant. And so you've obviously been being certified. You've worked with quite a number of clients now, haven't you? How many clients have you worked with over that time? Oh my gosh. Well, let's say over the last 12 years, I've worked with well over 100 different organizations. Um, and it's been fascinating. The journey has many ups and downs. And as we say at EOS, you've got to enter the danger a lot to be able to get people through that messy middle to that really achieve that vision they want to get to. Yeah. No, I completely agree. Again, our, our listeners are better to see this, but I'm going to very quickly show you this. Um, this is my elephant <laughs> in the room. I have a smaller one that I use in my in my workshop downstairs. But I think that, yeah, a lot of what I, I deal with my clients is about talking about the things they've probably never talked about before um, or not in an open and honest way. And I think that, you know, when you actually start to enter that danger and get into it, so much wonderful stuff kind of comes out of it. So a little bit of pain along the way, but the end result is just phenomenal. Well, as entrepreneurs, uh, you know, we all got to realize that a lot of people will say that will never work. People might be wincing at your mistakes, your missteps. But you know, mm-hmm. if you can pick yourself up, you can realize that every obstacle is a learning opportunity. And if it's in our DNA to step back, really take that clarity break, we can then get what we want. Again, I keep saying that mm-hmm. by stepping back. And it's that mindset that allow us to get that future success. Yeah, um, I think it, uh, you must see it as well. I mean, a lot of the, co- the companies we start working with, I mean, the owners are so engrossed in the business, busy fighting fires that they don't do that stepping back. And I think that can make such a huge difference. It certainly has in my life. I mean, I think it was a, almost the forced COVID lockdown that forced me to take a bit of a break and go, what is important? What do I want? Where am I headed? And, you know, it was amazing what a difference that has made. Well, Deborah, I have to be careful how I say this. And I always look at every obstacle as a gift. And I looked at COVID as an opportunity for me to hunker down with those I love and really mm-hmm. dig in with those clients to make sure that they were really working towards that Dan Sullivan term of unique ability. Yeah. And just to get into that EOS tool, that delegate and elevate checklist, make sure that you're doing what you love and you're great at. And delegate all that stuff that you... Uh, don't really like what you're good at delegate yeah. that stuff when we work with that unique ability in mind boy we can really get there but that's sometimes really challenging though isn't it because you know um all entrepreneurs have started from potentially around a kitchen table in a garage working with a, a mate or potentially on their own just starting up a business and so we become control freaks don't we i mean i i saw it my i saw it in myself in my own business after the event is that i was really struggling to let go because it was my baby i built it up i knew how to do everything and it was only when i actually started asking the question about you know what is it that i'm really really good at what is my unique ability and why am I doing all this other stuff that I was able to see that it could free me up if I actually and and improve my life if I could actually focus on that stuff but I'm a control freak I'm an entrepreneur that's what we do we like you know we need to keep a, a grip on everything that's going on so how do you encourage your teams that you work with to to take a look at that how I mean I know we've got the tool of delegate and elevate but what would you say is a the successful thing that you do with them to get them to understand what's important Oh, that's great. Well, not only do we have the VTO that sets up their core values, their core focus, your 10-year target, three-year picture, one-year plan, we dig into those rocks and those rocks have got to be that defining moment so we can reset every quarter and make sure we're getting what we want. Now, to fill in something else, I'd love to go back to that stoic philosophy of an if-then intention. If faced with this, what will you do then when that obstacle occurs? What will you do We go back to that clarity break and ask ourselves, hmm, am I making the right decisions for the business and for myself? We can step back and do that. More often than not, you're headed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, 
I'm going to ask you, and I, I guess some of this will come out in your book, and your book is available on Amazon now, isn't it? So we'll, we'll put a link in the podcast where people can actually find the book. I must admit, I only got it a couple of days ago. I've started reading it, but I, I haven't got to the end of it yet. But three three tips that you could give to people who are in their own business, who perhaps are feeling like it's not quite going the way they had expected it to, what would they be? Yeah, number one, download the VTO uh, from EOS Worldwide's website. That VTO is a supercharged two-page business plan that'll set you in the right direction. Number two, get yourself a coach. It doesn't have to be an EOS implementer. Obviously, we'd prefer that. Get yourself a coach and a mentor who can look over your shoulder and point things out if you're headed in the wrong direction. More often than not, folks don't realize that a 1% skew, let's say you're flying in an airplane from New Zealand to Los Angeles, that 1% skew could get you landing in Costa Rica or Vancouver, Canada. So let's make sure you're headed in the right direction. So that coach, that mentor will get you there. The other one, which is a little bit different is don't be afraid to design your year. Get out a 12 month calendar and just put it over, let's say an 11 by 17 sheet. Get your loved ones, get your business partners, get everyone on the same page with how your year is gonna unfold. Because when you do that, you've got a really good idea of how things can really come together. Mm. so do you have I mean I've got one of my wall actually up here do you have something at home that is visual because I mean I I love technology and I love software but I actually found that having a physical planner on the wall um, made it so much easier and we've got one at home as well which also kind of um, puts out our our holidays and when each of us because my my husband's a musician so he has a lot of music uh, concerts and events and things but I I have to say that yeah it it seemed old-fashioned to go out and buy a wall planner but I, I really loved having it I think it's a game changer. We've all got these digital devices that we can look at on our phone or our laptop. And I'll have to send you a picture from my session room. Right now I'm sitting outside, the birds are chirping, all these things are happening. You can hear them, yeah. Yeah, but in my room, I've got a bear rug from my grandfather that he shot way back in the day. And my annual calendar sits on top of that. It just folds over top of it. So I'll send it to you for a laugh. But Oh, I'd love to see that, yeah. I look at it every day. Wonderful, okay. Um, I heard you mention just a little while ago, ADD. Um, this is something that I'm, I'm quite fascinated because I just recently did an ADHD test myself and it seems like I might well be <laughs> on the scale somewhere, yeah. which might explain a few of my, my life um, decisions and things that I've done. But is that something that you have been diagnosed with? Is that something that, and how do you deal with it? Because I think a lot of entrepreneurs probably do have it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's hilarious, this journey we're on. About four or five years ago, uh, I started working with a, uh, a group that does mental health, drug addiction, and awareness. And they also do some personal mind rebalancing. And I'm like, Scott, we need you to take a couple of tests because we think you're on this spectrum. I did. <laughs> it's hilarious. They're like, hey, you know you're dyslexic too. I was like, yeah. And I said, the cool thing with EOS is we put that structure in place so we can create this scalable, repeatable machine by following steps. So for me, Deborah, those steps for the absolute aha moment. I know what my steps are in the process and my clients know the proven process too. So it makes it so much easier when everyone understands the steps and your deficiencies, because when you're vulnerable with one another, oh my gosh, that truck trust factor goes through the roof. Mm. It is interesting, isn't it? Because I must admit that initially looking at EOS and I've done an MBA and I've read all the books and, you know, um, academically reasonably bright and it's sort of like, oh my God, it's simple. I loved it because I come in, it is really, really simple, but will other people think it's too simple? And I had this fear at first when I started speaking to people because if it's that simple, you know, how does it really work? But of course we know it's, it's it, the, the brilliance is in the simplicity. So um, how do you have you ever had any clients who've kind of gone, hey, look, this is all a little bit too simple. We don't think this is going to work. And what do you do with that? It happens all the time. In fact, um, I had a client that was the first North America to win a gold medal in ski jumping and cross country skiing. His name's Billy DeMong. And he said to me, you know, Scott, this is really simple. And I said, well, so is ski jumping. All you got to do is go down that thing. He's like, well, it's not like that. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, neither is running a business. Let me explain. And it's those little fine tuning moments about what's your clarity? How do we get mindset? How do we execute? And just stepping back and putting these simple tools in place. It's trickier than it works, than it looks. Sorry about that. Um, and it happens all the time. It happens all the time. But we can get clarity on that stuff off we go. 
Yeah, no, I completely agree. And do you have, I mean, obviously you've got your book and we've got the EOS things. Um, do you have a favourite kind of personal tool that you use in your personal life as well? Or do you actually apply the EOS principles to your personal life? Oh, I do. It's oh, in the corner over my right my shoulder. Uh, yep. It's in the session room over my left shoulder. It's a surfboard and a mountain bike. And that tool is called a clarity break. So I'll go out, I'll surf this afternoon, probably for a couple hours. I'm not yep. very good. But it just gives me this clarity of just, if I can't catch a wave, that's fine. I'm just sitting there and thinking about things and they pop to my head or I'll go for a long two, three hour mountain bike ride. And again, it's that clarity that really allows me to attack the week and the day. Yeah. I must have, I just posted this morning actually on LinkedIn. Um, we do a cycle ride each morning with our dogs and we don't go particularly fast because we have to let the dogs keep up with us, but it's actually a really great time. And what I've started to realize is the days that I don't do it, um, I don't have a, such a great day. The days that I actually go out there and do that, it's it's just uh, it's a great start for the day. It really is. But I think you were talking about even taking longer breaks as well. Like it's important to actually allocate time, isn't it? Where you can say, I'm going to have two or three hours without electronic devices, without any distractions that I can actually just be with myself and with my thoughts. Is that fair? Absolutely. In fact, I did a talk uh, last week at one of our breakout sessions for EOS Worldwide. And I yep. talked about designing your environment so you can have those breakthroughs. And your environment is so much more than what you're looking at. It's what you're putting in your head, what you're eating, what you're experiencing, what you're looking at, uh, how you're behaving, who you surround yourself with. So we put all those things together that clarity really comes together and if it's take your dogs for a bike ride i like that too yeah <laughs> and they enjoy it too which is great and i must admit it sort of it also means if you've got dogs for us it was you know you have to go every day rain hail or shine we're going out there and we're actually doing it which is really cool okay um we're looking at time we're, we're about to wrap up is there anything else that you'd like to share with the listeners and i'd also just like to tell you you to tell them a little bit about you know your business and how they can get in contact with you yeah, the biggest piece is ignore society, build your version of success, be authentic to yourself, understand that your version, Deborah, of success is different than mine. Yeah. My version of success is I'm going to pull my practice back to have 15 amazing clients and I'm going to coach them and just really be vulnerable. That's my version of success. Mm. I've also got a personal plan that tells me in 15 years, Here's what I want my life to look like when I'm 70. So I'm trying to be as forward thinking as well. So design your own version of success, be authentic to yourself, communicate that with your loved ones and your business partners. I think it's really going to help everyone out a lot. It is interesting, actually. I think social media has um, made it easier for us to do comparison, you know, really, really easily. And also we have people sort of forcing their version of what success looks like. And I must admit, being a bit vulnerable, I kind of fell down the rabbit hole uh, probably about 12 months ago where I was seeing all these people saying, you need to do an online course. You need to, you know, you can make millions by doing an online course and pocket, you know, your IP. And I, and I kept kind of not really wanting to do it, but feeling drawn to it and then realised that, I actually love people that I have, you know, nothing gives me greater joy than being in a room with a team full of leaders and, you know, working with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I don't want to be doing an online course. I don't want to have millions of clients. I don't need to be a celebrity like you, much like yourself, you know, 15 to 20 really great clients and I am in my element. Uh, but, you know, there is that temptation to see the stuff that's out there on social media and go, well, that's what success looks like. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you? Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, Deborah. You're living and breathing the EOS life. Not only are you a master of your craft, well thought of, well respected, but you're helping others. And I think that's just amazing. Oh, thank you. And I see you are too. And that's, that's fantastic. So you've got your own EOS practice. Um, tell me, who do you work with? Or do you have a, a particular region that you like to work within? Um, tell me a bit about your practice. Yeah, so the two areas that I focus in, uh, Southern California, mainly San Diego, and uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. So those are the two areas I focus in. Um, and it's really rewarding. You know, we always say you can have 15 to 20 clients in your own backyard. Well, I absolutely love coming back and forth between San Diego and Scottsdale. Uh, it creates a fun environment for my family, for my wife and myself, and uh, it allows me to live the life I want to live. 
Yeah, that's great. I actually do a similar thing. I've actually got family over in Sydney. So uh, my two areas are New Zealand and Sydney. Uh, and I think it's great to have you know, clients in both of those areas. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Hey, well, look, I would just like to say it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, I'm really looking forward to finishing the book and I would encourage everybody to, to get grab a copy of that because honestly, from what I've read so far, um, it is great, really nice, easy read and lots of nuggets of wisdom in there. Um, thank you for sharing your experiences and your journey too. And I look forward to sort of following what you're up to over the years. Yeah, and if there's folks that are in New Zealand or in Australia, they want a copy of the book, heads up, it's not on Amazon down there, but if they oh. send me an email to scott at scottrusnack.com, I'll send them a PDF just as a, a help first. That is wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, and and as, as people know, that is one of our EOS values. And it's actually one of the main reasons I fell in love with EOS. When I saw Help First, I mean, all the other values have just as much meaning for me, but that one was like, yeah, that, that is great. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you again for your time. Um, it's great to talk to you. Cool. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Deborah. Right. That'll stop recording now. That's all fine. But oh my God, that was just so wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> oh, good. Well, as you can tell, I have you asked me a question, then I go in this direction. So sometimes I didn't probably ask the question. <laughs> the question you wanted to so but, but it's good and I mean everything you've given I just think I, I really I'm, I'm with you I kind of I didn't I didn't used to be I was a workaholic and I, I worked ridiculous hours and I just couldn't let go of anything and it was only really when I started to re, I, it was the death of my brother and my mum in a very short period of time that made me kind of go shit life is too short right I you can't be doing stuff that doesn't make your heart sing and um, I always loved coaching uh, but the EOS way of doing things was just a uh, uh, I mean, just revolutionary for me. It's like, oh my god, this is this is just exactly what I want to be doing. And the community, um, uh, yeah, everybody I've met in the community, I, I just love. I, I'm blown away by. You know, they're all super smart. They're they're super passionate. It's just, it's really lovely. I feel like I've come home. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. You know, it's interesting. I had some loved ones pass away. You know, my father-in-law, who said compete against apple he passed away about two years later from pancreatic cancer and he just said oh, no. go do your thing don't get stuck in the mire and that, that yeah. was a pretty big influence for me as well so yeah. yeah i think sometimes it takes you know some of those those big things to happen to make you kind of wake up and just go and i've just so i just recently got remarried um i'm 50 so i got married and i just turned 50 and you know it's really funny because i think again in the past the kind of people i was looking at were people who were successful and but that didn't really make me happy and it, you know you suddenly get to the point where it's like actually life is really really important having people around you who you genuinely um, love and want to be with is really important too so in a pretty good space now I'm quite enjoying it <laughs> so, well I think well, the next step is to figure, figure out how to get to New Zealand again oh uh, please do we'd love to host you <laughs> yeah I'm a huge rugby fan in fact when I was a kid I was on the junior, Canadian junior rugby team for a short spell we went to the UK and got our asses handed to us yeah but I met a ton of Kiwis and they're just freaking awesome we had just had such a good time so I got to get to an all blacks game one day oh definitely well I say if, if you ever come over you must um, let us host you we'd love to look after you love to show you our beautiful country um, uh, and I'll even come to a rugby game with you <laughs> yeah for sure yeah, cool. Hey, well, look, I um, hope it goes well with your tricky client next. And um, I will let you know when this is all kind of ready to go. And obviously, um, I will send you a copy and um, the video and stuff as well. So you're more than welcome to use it for your own purposes as well. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll definitely, uh, when the podcast is ready, I'll put it on my LinkedIn and I'll tell some others so that I uh, hope you can get some more followers as well. Uh, thank you. Really appreciate that. Brilliant. All right. Cheers. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. Brilliant. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye now. Thanks.